One of my biggest inspirations as a writer is a book series called Boogie Pop that I read back when I was a teenager. I want to say 15 when book one came out in the U.S. Originally released in 1998 and continuing from there. We only ever got the first four books in the series here in the U.S. But in volume two, there's a part where the author, Kohei Kodono, is talking about what the title means in the afterword. Uh, the title Boogie Pop. He was explaining that when he was trying to get his start, trying to get published for the first time, he was constantly getting rejected because his work was too weird, too out there. Publishers were always saying, oh, well, we can't publish this, but uh, maybe someone will, etc. And he had started to develop a deep admiration for and jealousy of pop media. He said that he loved pop and he wished that he could create it, that he could understand it, but it just wasn't totally in his blood. But as a big fan of it, he wanted to try. So he tried to create something that would combine his more out there boogie sensibilities with a more pop sensibility, hence boogie pop a series of books which is very accessible and easy to read but also about very weird out there esoteric subject matter and once he got famous with his book series he was able to make them more boogie and involve more of these things now i've sort of always based my take on writing after the boogie pop books not only did his style influence me a lot but that whole idea of boogie pop has been a huge deal for me in the way i go about creating things because when i was a teenager i too like my ideas were a little too out there no one could really relate to them no one found them that interesting and i always felt like i was just a little too boogie and i too have had a long-standing admiration for pop media i love things that are popular contrary sometimes to to what other people might think because there are plenty of popular things that i don't like or that i outright hate but uh you know in general i don't think my tastes are that out of line with common people's you know if i were to talk about anime which is obviously what i'm best known for commenting on I love Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, which is just about the most pop thing you could possibly imagine. It's so, like, concentrated to be something everyone would love. Um, so, when I go about creating things, it's very much with that same boogie pop mentality. I want people to like it, but I can't just make pure pop. And I know what it looks like. Not only do I know what it looks like, I know how the sausage is made. I know how to, how someone would go about creating pop media. You know, if especially if you wanted to do it even cynically. Look at the trends, figure out what's going on. You know, I think a lot of pop is created not cynically. I think a lot of it just comes from having the same sensibilities as most people. Like Full Metal Alchemist, for instance, is a series that I don't think has a bone of cynicism in it. It just so happens that the authors, you know, what they wanted to create was exactly what everyone loves. And so they created something that is so perfectly in tune with, like, a global universal understanding of great storytelling. But then there's other people who would never be able to make something like that. I could never make something like that. I could never make something so broad because... My interests are more narrow. The things I would want to create are more specific to myself. And I think that it's a struggle a lot of people have when they want others to appreciate their art, but they also want to make something that's personal and something that speaks to themselves. And sometimes it's really hard to reconcile those two things. And a lot of people think you shouldn't try to reconcile those two things. And a lot of bad art comes from trying to reconcile those two things, from trying to make something that's specific to yourself, but also trying to make it accessible and failing, you know, failing to reconcile them because you're doing it cynically. I think boogie pop art has to come from a place of loving pop art and wanting to imitate it and wanting to be a part of it.
So as a YouTuber, if you look at any of the big YouTube channels, the like really big ones, their content is always a certain way. There's, you know, <clears throat> the more cynical stuff, which is just clickbait, you know, stuff like the top 10 lists, the hottest girls in anime lists, if you want to be anime specific, you know, the stuff that will, no matter what, will get a million billion uh, people watching it because it's clickbait. And then there's the ones that are just like, uh, that even I can appreciate. I, I watch a lot of like, you know, well, not a lot. I, I can appreciate like what's good about like a Let's Play show. You know, someone who uploads every single day and their, their thing is that just that they have a personality and they're out there. And there's, you know, people who make like consistent content, people who make very scheduled, regulated content. And it's like, I get the appeal of those and some of them I even watch, but I can't do that. You know, but at the same time, if I tried to go so out there and be so boogie all the time, no one would like what I do. And I don't want to necessarily be that guy. Like, I don't find more pride in being so out there that no one watches it. I like being popular. I like uh, attracting people and inviting them to my art. So I write in the boogie pop fashion. You know, I write videos that are pretty easy to appreciate. I don't kowtow to what like is what I know is popular you know I don't try to write stuff I don't try to only cover shows that everyone's talking about or everyone's gonna want a video about I don't watch the shows that people want me to watch or anything like that but I present my videos in a way that I think people will understand and I do write to be accessible I don't try to write inaccessibly on purpose you know I feel like there's a lot of people who have a certain uh pride and let's say with anime like always using Japanese titles or trying to be very specific about like industry stuff and and expecting your audience to sort of understand that. I'm not that type of guy. I try to write in a way that the most people will know what I'm talking about while still making the point that I want to make. Which the point I want to make might be something more bizarre, might be something people didn't expect to hear about or didn't think they cared about, you know. I've always been one who sort of thinks that my goal is to get an audience to care about something they didn't know that they cared about, to sort of bring them on a journey with me, to say like, hey, I'm going to make you understand my feelings. That's why in stuff like my Asterisk War video, I say like, you know, I'm going to take you on this journey with me so you can understand why I hate this studio and this show, because it's invitational. I want you to be along for the ride. I'm not writing for people who already agree with me or already feel the way I feel. Not that I necessarily think there's a problem with writing that way, but I think there's not enough recognition of that there's these different intents. So let's take a look at a, one of what I consider to be the absolute masterpieces of boogie pop fiction. House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. I don't know if you can read that title because there's no lighting back here. But uh, what's funny about this book is it starts off with the dedication that just says, this is not for you, um, which is kind of ironic because this book actually has a very strong pop sensibility. It's very out there, and a lot of it is a commentary on the ideas of criticism, the ideas of postmodernism, um, and of uh, formalism. There's a lot of that stuff in here, but it's wrapped in a package that's so easy to understand. Even though the book is written with this maze-like, esoteric style, it still has basic dramatic structure that resonates with people. And it's still, it's sort of like it's saying, hey, here's insanity, but I'm going to help you navigate insanity. And therefore, it's very boogie pop. Whereas a book that really is not for you would be Mark Z. Danielewski's next book, Only Revolutions, which I cannot understand any of because this book is completely uninviting. It does not expect the viewer or the reader to sort of go along with it. It just is like, here's, here's the story. Uh, you know, follow it if you can. And if you can't, then... I guess you're fucked. So if I were to describe what is the difference between pop and boogie, it would be that level of invitation. I'm pouring myself a drink right now. I've got my uh, 
my barrel of of wine here. There's sort of a gradient, you know, far out to totally accessible, the gradient. Totally accessible would be top 40. You know, when people think pop, they think music. And that's because music has such a huge disparity between, <clears throat> like, pop music is heard by everyone and really obscure music might be heard just by the guy who made it. So, pop, and they're, and they're considered to be the same medium. You know, like, TV show is always going to be some degree of pop, no matter how boogie it might be, because it, to even make it on TV, you have to be somewhat pop. There's a medium of music anybody can create at any time, and it's all considered music. So pop, this top of the, you know, top of the worldwide, <clears throat> everyone hears it stuff, is very inviting. Pop is easy to understand. It speaks to things that everyone gets, everyone innately appreciates, you know. Simple rhythms, simple time signatures, simple lyrical content, things that are relatable to everybody, you know. Things that most people have been through. And of course, not literally everyone can relate to pop. A lot of people who are into boogie stuff are into it specifically because they can't relate to pop. But then there's stuff that sort of strikes that balance. I would say uh, one of the most successful, like, boogie pop artists who leans more on pop would be like Lady Gaga, where she clearly has an edge of being a little bit more out there and, and being a little bit more specific, but while still having this incredibly broad pop appeal. Whereas going in the other direction, you might get something like Coheed and Cambria, who is extremely accessible and a lot of people love them, and they have some big hit singles, but they are still kind of weird. And so people who reject pop often get into bands like that. Um, but the far end of the spectrum would be like your Merzbow or something, which is, I mean, even that's accessible enough that someone's heard of it, you know, that it's like the go-to example for weird music. But like, you know, that's, that's sort of the face of what Boogie is, the far end of the spectrum. So what's funny to me about all this is that uh, the way we talk about it, I think there's different people have sort of different expectations for the works they go into and, uh, and the way they criticize them. And it's interesting to see these differences. Like, my dad once said to me that in his opinion, the greatest songwriter of all time was... Uh, Billy Joe Armstrong of Green Day. And my dad's standard for what is great songwriting is essentially that it's accessible, that everyone loves it. You know, like, it made the most money, it got the most ears, therefore it's the best. Which is funny, It's I guess it's closer to an objective standard than most things can get, like it did in fact reach the widest audience, does that mean it's the best? But I think someone like him or someone with that mindset is judging everything against pop. It's basically saying that being pop is being good. And so from a critical standpoint, he'd be comparing everything against how accessible is it. Whereas a lot of critics more judge things by how strongly does it convey its message. Here's a great example of a boogie pop album that has somehow managed to have just the right level of se pop sensibility to be huge, Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly. This is an album that was on every album of the year list last year at the top. You know, everyone loved it, every critic appreciated it because it was very accessible in places and very much had this pop appeal while also being really weird, really out there, really experimental, having lots of great artists work on it, and sending this message very clearly. But the thing is that To Pimp a Butterfly is very inviting. Like, that's why the pop stuff is there. Because what Kendrick Lamar did was not just say, here's my message. He said, I want you to understand my message. And the way that he delivers it to as broad an audience as possible is by injecting those pop things in it. 
if his album didn't have the song All Right on there, then fewer people would listen to the album and therefore fewer people would hear the message. He wants you to get it. He wants you to come in and feel the things he's feeling with him. So he puts in songs that will drag you in, you know? And I have no doubt that that's what Kendrick goes for because he doesn't have to. I know he... He probably, you know, you could say cynically that he wants to make money, and that's what you could cynically say about a lot of pop art, is that it's there to make money, propagate, you know, take advantage of people and what they like and bring more money in. But I don't think all pop art is like that, or even necessarily most. I think someone like Kendrick can be out there if he wanted to. He just released his uh, Untitled, Unmastered EP, where it's just like, seven songs that didn't make the cut for his last album, and he he didn't try to make them pop or accessible. He just dropped them out there for anybody who was interested, and he could have done something like that with To Pimp a Butterfly, just made an esoteric piece of art and said, eh, take it or leave it. But he didn't. He wanted you in. So this brings me to an interesting conversation that's sort of been happening around uh, the music reviewer Anthony Fantano has been doing these podcasts about... Uh, the new Kanye West album, The Life of Pablo, which you may have seen me give this huge drunken rant about on this channel because I really hated it. But uh, Kanye West, after this album came out, there were a lot of reviews for it, and he sort of said that he thinks that... He said something to the effect of white people shouldn't be reviewing black music or something like that. When And the argument has more or less come around to the idea that, like, uh that maybe white people inherently can't get certain things about the black experience, about, you know, what Kanye is trying to communicate on this album. And I think that's an interesting point, because what that says to me is that the album is deliberately uninviting. It's literally saying, I didn't make this for white people. I made it for just a certain, you know, a certain uh, race. Deliberately making something that... You don't want everyone to appreciate. And then, in spite of that, in Kanye's case, nonetheless, promoting it heavily to all audiences, asking for a lot of money, uh, and and asking a white man to help him through his incredible debt that he apparently has. <laughs> but uh, leaving all that aside, it's an interesting conversation to have. Because I feel like Kendrick Lamar's album... While it is heavily addressed to black people, a lot of the lyrics are specifically saying, like, hey, black community, I'm talking to you. But nonetheless, it still tries to invite everyone to be a part of this message. It tries to invite people. And I'm not saying that's better or worse than taking the approach of saying, like, I'm just making this for, for certain people. But I think it's interesting once you start bringing critics into the mix. Because critics, all they are are spokespeople for the audience. That's all we, we're representatives. People like me, we're, we're basically delegates, represented delegates for, for the common populace's opinions, right? Like, every critic is to some extent writing about their thoughts, but the reason that people watch them is that their thoughts represent more people, you know? Uh, I've always, uh, been interested in that phrase where they said that like every every one person who speaks out represents a hundred people who are silent I don't necessarily agree with that as a youtuber when you have a comment section you slowly realize that a lot of your comments are from the fringe are from the people who don't at all represent everybody else and that's why they're commenting that's why they're raising their voice because they're not uh, because they're underrepresented within a group but um, I do think that when a reviewer becomes popular, it's because the things that they feel represent what a large amount of people feel, you know? The reason people watch my videos is that they can relate to them. No one would watch my videos if they couldn't relate. The biggest reason people have difficulty growing their channels is often because People don't see them as relatable. Someone like that anime snob who has his little fan base but he can never seem to grow is because he's so exclusionary. He so doesn't invite people to 
partake in his opinions. He just says, this is what I feel and you all should agree with me or get out. And, you know, people can't relate to it. People don't understand his perspective. Whereas with someone like me, my popularity is entirely dependent on the fact that people do relate to me. And I've put the effort into that, you know. I could write stuff that's all boogie that I don't expect anybody to get, but I don't want to be that guy. I want to invite people. The reason I write is because I want people to understand me. So what critics really are are mouthpieces for an audience. And... I think that there are cases to be made for the fact that we need more, you know, we need more diversity in criticism because I think that there are people who are starved for it. And I think that there are people who could provide it who don't necessarily know that they are waited for, you know. And even I feel like I'm one of those people. Like, I made this video at one point called, uh, you know, we need... I need uh, reviews and analysis from more perspectives. And I was saying how, like, you know, I'm a white guy and most reviewers are white guys. But the funny thing about that is I actually see myself as being very different from most of those people. While I relate to them in terms of, like, lifestyle, uh, like, the reason I do reviews is that I don't see my opinion represented all the time. Um, Especially in anime. That's why I cover anime and not video games as much. Because, like... There are people who sort of represent my perspective on games, but there's no one who represents my perspective on anime. So I started making stuff so that I could represent that perspective. And then people who, who sort of said, wow, you've, you've said what I've been thinking all this time and no one else was saying, I'm going to follow you. And those are the people who follow me. So I think that if it's true that there aren't enough black people covering black music, then it means that there just need to be more, like more critic, more black critics need to step up because clearly there's a thirst for it. If there's people out there who are upset, who want to see what black people think about black music, then, then like send that message out so that black reviewers can go, oh, I'm needed. I will come to the rescue, you know, but, uh, but that is ultimately what reviewers are. We're here to represent what's needed. If it turns out that black critics aren't wanted as much as people seem to think they are, as much as someone like, you know, obviously Kanye wants his music to be more represented by the black community. But if it turns out that there's no desire for that, then it would be kind of pointless. It would just make the the reviewers themselves be boogie. You know, it's a boogie perspective, maybe. Maybe, maybe not a lot of black people read reviews. It's like, it's more likely than you think that like, the, that like a percentage of the audience for those reviews who are who are black is incredibly small. You know, not to get like too deep into these politics here, but I do think it's funny when we've had this conversation that's coming up again and again, especially because of the Academy Awards, where people were saying how they were like, you know, so white and there were so many white people in there. And uh, all I could think was, but white people are like, overwhelmingly the majority of our country so it seems kind of natural that there would be more of them in the roles you know like the reason a minority is underrepresented is that there is less of them they are a minority that's why uh somewhere if you were in india for instance everyone in movies is indian if you're in japan the reason that Japan feels so ethnocentric where they write about anime and movies and stuff is because there's not a lot of people of other ethnicities there, you know, and, uh, it would be nice if there were, like, an equivalent number of African-American actors nominated to how many are there, like, how many African-Americans are in the country, but, like, I don't think it's completely unreasonable that when your cutoff point is five people, you know, who ultimately get selected that it would end up being five people who are from the overwhelming majority race of the country. So in other words, I think the reason that there's so much less representation has to do with population and interest. And I think that art, when it strives to be invitational, can bring in people from other perspectives 
people who might not get it inherently, but you can make them get it. You know, like, that's, again, my goal, because when I grew up, no one seemed to understand my opinions on things. When I was growing up as a kid, the things I liked were things that nobody around me seemed to like, and I couldn't get people into the things I liked. So that's why I started writing. So, so like, for me, it's all about being invitational. It's all about bringing people into the fold. And I think it's a little backwards, like, with someone like Kanye to write an album that he clearly intends not to be invitational and then to treat it like it is, you know, to say, like, I wrote this just for certain people, but you should all buy it, <laughs> you know, it's a sort of odd stance. But, um, you know, I don't think critics are the ones who decide whether an album is good or bad at what it sets out to do. It's really the artist who decides that and the and, and everyone in the audience individually, each person individually decides whether or not the album resonates with them. And uh, I think it's great that stuff that is full boogie comes out, you know. I think it's great that there's there's stuff that no one gets. And especially if it gets popular, it can be interesting, you know. Like, I think most of the popular boogie stuff is because someone who has made boogie pop art, like Kanye West, who made My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, which is an extremely boogie pop album. You know, it's a very specific perspective, but presented in a very pop way that everyone can understand and is very inviting. I think it's very interesting when someone like that makes something that's so boogie and so out there and, and is really just for themselves. And then I think the reason that this happens, the reason that people go through that process is that it's it's just a simple matter of survivability. Like someone like Kohei Kodono who clearly wanted to write Boogie but he couldn't afford to because he was trying to become a professional writer. So he wrote Boogie Pop, got popular, and then he started making the books more and more out there because he sort of reached those people. You know, it's not easy. If, you, if you're trying to write something that's only going to reach five people, it's not easy to find those five people. It's not easy to get out there into the world and, and do that unless you start boogie pop unless you or, or just full pop unless you get people hooked and then you can find that smaller amount of people who care and uh you know i've always said that that's sort of what i try to do and, and it's worked out well for me like this channel is completely emblematic of me trying to do that where um you know there was a time when i would have just wanted to be this like just off-the-cuff rants and weird videos and bizarre things that I post on this channel um, when I, I could never have no one would have watched these when I first started like if, if Digibro After Dark was all that Digibro was then I'd have no audience but because I have so many followers on my main channel through my more pop art then when people you know like the people who are into the boogie stuff find it this channel probably has, like, on average, 2,000 to 3,000 views a video. And my main channel averages between uh, 15,000 to 100,000 views a video, depending on how popular it is. So it's like a trickle-down effect. I get, you know, those, those few people who understand this message will come over here and get this stuff. So, um... I think a lot of people try to strive for that. We try to strive for, I want to be so popular that even the weird shit I get will be popular. Uh, e the weird shit I make, rather. And I've said that many times in the past, that that was my ultimate goal, was to, like, was to be so big that I could make something more specific and it would still have an audience. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what Daniel Lewski was going for. You know, like, this book could never have gotten published if House of Leaves wasn't already popular and had his name out there. There's no fucking way. Uh, so, yeah. And, and I don't think critics necessarily get only revolutions. You know, I haven't seen a lot of positive reviews for it. I haven't seen a lot of people talk about it because whatever audience understands it is buried deep and they don't necessarily have representatives out there representing their opinion their critics you know there's only so many of us and we don't speak for everybody most of us are popular because we speak for a fairly large group of people i'm sure there's anime fans out there who feel like no one is speaking what they think 
and they're just waiting for that one reviewer, or they are that one reviewer, and no one watches them because no one else feels the way they do, you know? You have to be pop. You have to have some pop sensibility to even be a critic. And mine is a boogie pop sensibility, which happens to, you know, there's plenty of people who are right in that middle section, and that's where I go for. I really think that anime in general... I think I've, uh, I've, I've said something to this effect maybe somewhere before, but, like, the, the biggest anime channels currently have around 600,000 subscribers. I think that, as a pure anime channel, the most you can ever get on YouTube is a million subscribers. I think one million will be the cutoff point for the biggest anime channel that ever comes around. And I think that the biggest my channel will ever get will be around 400,000 subscribers. 450,000 is what I really want. I want my channel to be the exact size of the population of Virginia Beach, the city I live in, which is 450,000 subscribers. I think that's the most I could ever get to because my videos are specific enough that they will never appeal to every anime fan who would subscribe to a YouTube channel. But they will appeal to enough of them that I could get 450 k. And that's, like, my cutoff point. It'll always be that, you know, not pop, but boogie pop, but not boogie, which will be anime snob who never breaks 10k at the absolute most. Anyway, I hope that was an interesting thought. Uh, kind of got rambly and weird in the middle, but I think I said everything I wanted to. By the way... I've gotten a few comments on these videos where people are worried that I've been, like, seem to be drinking a lot in my videos. Uh, it's because I film when I drink. Drinking helps me to be more loose and to talk unscripted, which I'm not that great at, unless I'm drinking a little bit when I'm, like, a little buzzed. Um, it helps me to flow better, it helps me to be more passionate. If you watch my older vlogs, there's constant jump, jump cuts and, like, parts I had to cut out. But because of, like, getting better at talking and then sort of feeling loose and, like, I can go on and on, you know, makes it so I don't have to do that as much. So, like, it's not that I'm drinking every single day, it's that, like... I want to say 80% of the times that I drink, I end up recording something as a result of it. So, 